Romans chapter 8, 1 Corinthians 2, Ephesians chapter 4, writings of Paul. And uh, we're diving into a new series talking about how to go forward in our faith. I suggest to you today that we have to be more surrendered. If we want to go forward, we have to be more surrendered. We have to surrender various aspects of our life. Today we're focused on the mind. I want to surrender my mind to God. Now, I want to be very honest with you, very transparent with you, uh, talk about my own journey in this and, and admit some things to you, and hopefully they won't get rid of me for admitting these things, but uh, I have struggles to win the battle in my mind. I struggle. I have difficulty sometimes staying focused. You know, when I open up the Word and I want to read the Word and I want to get a fresh Word from God on a given day, I'll read a couple of sentences and, and I'll realize that my mind has gone somewhere else. I don't know if this has ever happened to anybody. My mind has just gone somewhere else. I'm reading the words, I read down a few verses, and then I realize I didn't even understand what I read. I didn't even hear what I read. I, I, I lost my focus and I struggle with that. It seems like we're the most distracted generation ever because of the digital age, the number, the thousands and thousands of pieces of data that we're trying to uh, 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 take in every day. And so it's a difficulty, and I struggle sometimes to stay focused. Not only when I'm reading the Word, but sometimes when I'm praying. I'm just being honest. I'm praying. I'm talking to God. And the next thing I know, my mind has gone somewhere else. I'm not doing this audibly. I'm just speaking to Him in the quiet Quietness of my mind and heart, and, and my mind will just drift away, and I don't even realize it. And I, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm not praying anymore. I'm thinking about something else that's going on that day or that week or something else that's on my mind. And I struggle with that, just to stay focused. Throughout the week, I find sometimes that my mind will, will drift towards some negative thoughts, concerns, anxieties, and... and, and it's kind of subtle. It doesn't, you know, you're not, it's not even really apparent at first. And, and your mind's just drifted off and you're, and you're starting to worry about these negative things that might happen. And what I've discovered about these things is like most of these things never happen. They never come to fruition. And yet our mind will worry about those things. And this week I was thinking about that and I thought, what a waste of time and energy to focus on these things that might happen, most of which never happen. But it's something we deal with. It's a, it's a battle every day. It's a, it's a battlefield our mind is. It's a battle we need to win. I'm going to talk about that today. Sometimes my eyes will take something in and I will be tempted to entertain thoughts in my mind that ought not be there. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> my eyes will take something in and I will be tempted to think on things that I ought not to think on. And so it's a struggle, it's a fight, it's a battle, every day, every hour, every moment. Now there were two things that kind of came to mind this week, very simple, straightforward, I think you can understand. I'm a sports guy, I grew up playing sports from age 5 to 20 for the most part. Uh, I, I played sports and I played every sport. Back then that meant basketball, baseball, and football. Soccer didn't really exist in North Louisiana back then. Anyway, and swim and golf and all these other things. I mean, people did those things. But, you know, playing all the sports meant basketball, baseball, and football. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. It dates me a little bit. But, and not only that, but they happened in seasons. It was really a novel concept. It happened in seasons. So you could, you could play all of them and not miss any of them. You know what I mean? And so, and, and you played for your school. And these happened in certain time frames, and you could do all of them and not miss any of them. And I love sports. And, and what's true of basketball, baseball, and football is that there's both offense and defense. They're team sports, but there's both offense and defense, and you have to do both in order to be successful. And so on defense, the concept is I'm trying to keep the other team from scoring points. Okay, I'm trying to keep the other team. If I'm going to win, I have to keep the other team from scoring. And, and when it comes to our mind and the battle that's going on in our mind, we have to play defense sometimes, which means there's certain thoughts that don't need to go there. There's certain thoughts when they crop up, they need to be shut down. There's certain thoughts that come to mind and we need to cast them out as quickly as we identify them. And that's defense. That's saying, I'm not going to entertain this sinful thought. I'm not going to entertain this negative thought. I'm not going to worry about this thing that probably won't ever happen. And you just make a conscious choice to kick it out of your mind. That's playing defense. But you also have to play offense. We have to choose to think on good things. 
We're going to talk today about some of the ways, some of the practical ways to do that. And I had a breakthrough this week, and y'all are going to think, man, that's the most elementary thing. That guy's not nearly as smart as I thought he was. Uh, but it was a breakthrough for me. You know how sometimes a thought comes over you, and you're like, man, that's a, that, that, I can grab a hold of that. I can, I can work with that. And that happened to me this week, and here, here's the thought that went through my mind. I get to choose what I think about. It just dawned on me. I don't have to think about whatever comes to mind, whatever happens, whatever I see, whatever I experience. I get to choose what I think about. And I started focusing on some of the positive things rather than the negative things. It made all the difference in my attitude. I get to choose what I think about. Maybe that's what you're here to hear today. Maybe today you're you're not trying to figure out how to go further in your faith because you're not even in faith yet. You're still investigating the faith. And look, I'm glad you're here. You're welcome here. I hope you will uh, uh, continue to consider the possibility of being in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But this is for everybody. You get to choose what you think about. Christian or non-Christian, it's the same. We get to choose what we think about. Now, I don't think I'm alone in this. I don't think I'm the only one struggling in the mind. I think we all can admit and agree that we have struggles, we have battles, we have wars going on, Christian or non-Christian. We have things in our mind, and we're wrestling with things back and forth. Now, One question we need to ask ourselves, what's at stake here? What's at stake that I win this battle that's raging in my mind? I want to propose to you that you can't win in life if you don't win the battle of the mind. You cannot win in life if you don't first win the battle that's raging in the mind. Let me give you some examples. You answer these questions. These are not rhetoric. That means you have to answer yes or no, okay? Do this, this, or answer verbally, okay? It'll help me if you'll participate. All right. Is there any chance that I'm going to be a good father if I don't spend any time with my children? Is there any chance? It's impossible, isn't it? It's impossible. All right. Is there any chance that I'm going to save enough for retirement if I don't learn how to live on less than I make and put some back? Is there any chance I'll save enough for retirement? 45% of those aged 30 to 54 right now in America have zero saved for retirement, including 40% of baby boomers. Newsflash baby boomers, it's not that far out. What's interesting about retirement saving is that pension promises are going down as a rule, which means your contribution is going, what you contribute and accumulate is what you're going to have one day. That, that notion is going up, and yet people are saving less and less and less and less. We didn't come to talk about that today. But it's true, if I don't master that, I'm not going to save enough to retire. Any chance that I'll be a great athlete if I never practice? Okay? Here's what I remember from sports is that I spent far more time practicing on my own, actually practicing, working out, whatever different things go with the particular sport. I spent far more time doing that on my own individually than I did in the organized practice. When you think about somebody who's playing at the, even at like the high school level, a, a sport at the high school level, they have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of hours invested to perform at a high school level. Level. Any chance somebody's going to be good at that without any practice? No. Any chance someone's going to be a great student if they never listen in class, never open a book, never write anything down, never study their notes, they just show up, but they never pay attention? Any chance? Now, I know there's some smart people out there now. All right, my sister was one of them. All right, I don't like her for that. I like sports, she liked note cards. You know what I'm talking about? Like you want to master this test that's coming up, so you put everything they could possibly ask on a note card. You keep flipping the note cards until you can answer them all and get them all right. You know what I'm talking about? I didn't have time for note cards, okay? (laughs) I just had other things on my mind besides note cards, all right? But there's no chance you're going to be a great student if you put nothing into it. And I want to say this. There's no way you're going to win in life if you don't win the battle in your mind. It's just impossible. There's no chance that it will happen. We have to have a healthy mind to have a successful life. Now this one's just for the Christian, so if you're still investigating the faith, just, just hit the pause button for a minute, okay? This is just for the Christians. There's no way you're going to live a surrendered life without a surrendered mind. 
When we come to God, we say, God, I give you everything. I'm going to love you with my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength. I'm going to give you my mind. I'm going to let you take over, take control of my mind. I have to give him my mind. We cannot move forward in faith without giving him our mind. Now, we have to understand that there is a war raging, and it's good versus evil. It's, it's the plans of God and the plans of Satan. It's the plans of the Spirit and the plans of the flesh that are at war with one, with one another in the mind, day in and day out. Now, when I was growing up, some of y'all won't remember this, but when I was, some of you will. When I was growing up, they, we had real cartoons, and they were on Saturday morning, and we would turn them on. And, and one of the ones I remember is, y'all remember, they, it seemed like it was Tom and Jerry, but they had the, the one where the devil would be on this shoulder and the angel would be on this shoulder. And it's like both of them are kind of whispering in the ear, like, what do I do here? You know, this is the good advice, this is the bad advice. Now, that seems silly, but that illustration is actually not too far off theologically. Paul describes it over and over again that all the time there's, there's different voices speaking in. We've got to determine which voice are we going to listen to. Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice. And we've got to listen to him and do accordingly. So it's a battle. It's a battle. What's at stake, before we dive into Romans chapter 8, what's at stake here in this battle for our mind? I believe your very life is at stake. I believe sometimes if we lose the battle in our mind on a particular thing, I believe that all of us are one decision away from wrecking and ruining our life. Don't, don't, don't get high and mighty and holy roller and Mr. or Miss Sunday School in here on me. Listen, you're one mistake away. You're one mistake away from wrecking or ruining your life. And listen, adultery doesn't start physical. It starts right here. It starts in the eyes. It starts in the mind. Eventually, eventually something happens, and then a, a family is ruined. It starts right here. You've got to win right here if you want to win in life. Our life is at stake, and I would say, too, our eternity is at stake. Not only that, the lives and eternity of some people around us could be at stake based on us winning, allowing God to win this battle that's raging in our mind. Now, with that in mind, let's look at Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 5. You're going to have to listen quick, okay? With, listen fast. First group didn't listen fast. That's why we ran a little late. So <laughs> y'all are going to listen fast, and we'll get out in time to eat because everybody's hungry. Okay, Romans 8 and verse 5. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. So without God working in your mind, you will naturally think about sinful things. Romans 8, verse 5. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit... Think about things that please the Spirit. Or if God is in control of your mind, you will think about things that please God. Now, Paul's about to offer a compare and contrast. There's people who are dominated by the flesh, dominated by the natural man, dominated by the natural mind. Uh, and then there's people that are dominated by the Spirit of God. It's two different, two different groups of people. He doesn't offer a third option. He said these are two different groups of people. Even though the battle will continue to rage for those of us that are Christians... Um, he describes Christians as those people who are dominated, uh, controlled by the Spirit. Verse 6. So letting your sinful nature control your mind. In other words, I just do what comes naturally. I do whatever the culture tells me. That leads to death. Here he's talking about spiritual death, separation from God, eventually leading to eternal death and separation from God. Jesus said, and tor tor torment. All right, but, uh, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you, now remember he's talking to Christians, so that's us, Christians, if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. I hope that's a true statement for you. If you belong to Jesus, then you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You've given over control of your mind to God. He says, you Christians are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And that's a big if. You know, a lot of people won't take the Bible and think it's just unilateral promises. God just pours them out on everybody. No, there's, there's a lot of conditions described here. You have the mind, you have the will of God, you have the Spirit of God, you have the thoughts of God, if you have the Spirit of God living in you. Now, Paul doesn't want us to miss this, so in my version, in parentheses, it says, 
And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. Translation. Once you recognize Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world, once you accept Him and forgiveness of your sin, once you ask Him to forgive you of your sin, make you right with God based on what He's done for you, it's then that the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. You are filled with God's Spirit. Now either it's in you, He is in you, or He is not in you. The scary thing, which we'll get into in a minute, is that many people believe they are saved. They are Christians. They, all, they do belong to God. And yet they do not have, they do not possess the Holy Spirit of God. They do not have the mind of God. He said, and remember, those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. Verse 10, and Christ lives within you, Christians. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Once a person becomes alive by accepting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, they will never die. Jesus said that himself. Your, your body will die and your spirit will go right into the presence of God and it will be a seamless transition. You'll, you'll still be alive. Verse 11, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. You. So Paul does a compare and contrast. He said there's people that have the Spirit of God and there's people that don't. People that have the Spirit of God, they hear from God, they do the things of God, they're dominated, they're controlled by the Spirit of God. It's just part of it. They've surrendered their mind, they've surrendered their life to the will of God, which we're going to talk about next week, the surrendered will. That describes the person who's accepted Christ by faith. Then there's people who have not done that and they have not received the Holy Spirit. They have not. And they're controlled by the flesh. They're controlled by the natural man. Now, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Shouldn't be too far away from where you are right now in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, But it was to us that God revealed these things by His Spirit. These things being, you can go read it, uh, 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 the gospel, uh, eternity, the things of God has been revealed to us by His Spirit. You say, I thought things of God were revealed because I, I heard the words. Somebody spoke the words. I read the words on paper. Well, you can take the words in in English on paper by reading them or audibly by hearing them. But that doesn't mean you understand them, receive them, accept them. You just hear them. He said, it, to be revealed to you, the Spirit must do that work. For His Spirit... That is, God's Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, for His Spirit, God's Spirit, searches out everything and shows us, the Holy Spirit, it says, shows us God's deep secrets. All of us in this room right now, in our own mind, we have secrets. You say, no, well, I, you know, I, I, my spouse is sitting here beside me, we've been married 30, 40 years, whatever, we don't have any secrets. No, 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 no. In your thoughts, in your mind... There are places, there are things, there are thoughts that you have thought that you have never revealed to anybody. Deep thoughts, secrets, struggles, questions, anxieties, worries, thoughts that you've had here that you've never articulated, you've never said to anybody. Here Paul says, God has things that have been kept secret from many human beings, but they've been revealed to those who have his spirit, the deep secrets. Look at verse 11. No one knows, no one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. So you know the thoughts I'm describing that no one else knows. You know them because they're yours. They're in your mind, okay? No one can know a person's thoughts except the person's own spirit, and no one can know God's thoughts except for God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit. Not the world spirit, it has its own philosophy, as you know. So we can know, we can know, we can believe, we can embrace, we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. Listen, one of the things you're going to have to do to keep your mind right is you're going to have to write down some of your, some of your favorite promises from Scripture. You have to put them on a note card, write them out, type them up, whatever you want to do. 
You have to put them on your window. You have to put them in your dashboard. You have to put them in your book bag. You have to put them uh, in your sports bag. You have to put them somewhere, and you need them to pop out throughout the day to remind you of these truths that you've embraced, these wonderful things of God that have been promised to you, because if you don't, you're going to go the whole day with these negative uh, inputs, and you're going to struggle. Put these promises of God in front of you, the wonderful things God has freely given us. He says in verse 13, When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. Now, when you come here and we do this, same might be said of a small group setting where someone is teaching the Bible. When you come here, I don't know how to explain this, okay? I really don't. But the Holy Spirit of God takes control of my mind and my mouth and my heart and these notes and has me to share words with you that are spiritual words that can be received by spiritual people who have the Holy Spirit of God. And let me tell you the miracle that happens. As we sit in here, 150 of us in this room right now, or 130 of us or whatever it is, we all leave here feeling like God communicated something to us. Now that's a miracle. How can that happen? It's because the Holy Spirit of God produces spiritual words that come out of somebody holding the Bible in their hand, articulating the Word of God, and you hear, by way of the Spirit, what God wants to speak to you, and you leave out of here thinking, now I heard something that was just for me. Well, it wasn't just for you. But you heard what God wanted you to hear. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Do you know how diverse we are in this room? Do you know how many different religious backgrounds we come from in this room? Do you know how much different uh, our exposure to the Scriptures are? Those who've had a lot, those who've had a little, those who've had none, those who've been in it for 50 years. The idea that all of us could get something out of the same talk is a miracle. And if you bump into me on Monday and we sat in my office and talked, you'd be like, this guy is boring. (laughs) There ain't nothing miraculous right here coming out. You know, it's just, he's just an average Joe, Right? Paul said, when we came around, we didn't come with man's wisdom or with great speaking tactics or manipulative sales pitches. We came in the power of the Spirit. We just shared spiritual things and asked God to let it land on the minds and hearts of those that, where he would see fit. He said, when we told you these things, that we were not words from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual Truths, verse 14, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. And you've had this experience when you're talking about spiritual things with somebody and you can tell they're not receiving any of it. People that don't have the Spirit of God can't receive these spiritual things. God has to remove the scales from their eyes. The Spirit has to do a work in them like He did in you. And they have to hear it and understand it by means of the Holy Spirit. It says... People who aren't spiritual, people that don't have the Holy Spirit, they can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things. See, we have wisdom because we have the mind of God. We can evaluate things. We can understand things. We can shed light on things, spiritual and non-spiritual, because God gives us wisdom. But they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. And I don't have time to break all this down. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who who, who knows enough to teach him? That's rhetorical. No one. But we understand these things, for we have, we Christians have, the mind of Christ. If you're a believer in Jesus, you can have, as you surrender your mind to him, you can have the mind of Christ. You can have the thoughts of God. You can have his agenda on your mind and heart at all times. Now turn to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. This is where I'm going to ask you to uh, listen fast. Okay, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Some of you are here and you're like, I didn't understand any of that. That made no sense to me. That didn't resonate with me. Uh, I'll be glad when this is over. Okay, hold on a second because I got something for you right here. Okay, this one's for you. You came here to hear this. All right, if you didn't get any of that other, you came here to hear this. It's very straightforward. It's a very simple formula. I'm asking you to believe it and embrace it. Okay, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Anybody have any anxiety? Anybody have any stress? Anybody worry about things? 
Anybody concerned about things? Anybody laying on your pillow at night and, and you're having a little bit of trouble going to sleep because you got some things rattling around in your head and how are we going to get them done? How's this going to work out? And so on and so forth. Okay, here's your formula right here. Four things, very straightforward. Don't complicate it. Okay, it's easy. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, it says this. Don't worry about anything. That's point one. Okay? Don't worry about anything. Number two, instead, pray about everything. Three, tell God what you need. Four, thank Him for all He's done. There's your formula. There's your formula. Eliminate stress. Overcome anxiety. Turn things over to God. Sleep well at night. Peace in your mind and heart. Here it is. Don't miss it. Don't worry about anything. And when you feel those feelings of worry start to creep up, go to step two. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need, not that you're informing Him. He already knows. And thank Him for all He has done. You get to choose what you think about. I was on a lake with some small children on Friday. Hooks flying everywhere. Don't recommend it. And there were a couple of moments where I got to choose what I was going to think about. You know? They call it a bird's nest when the string gets all messed up. When people get, you know, hooks stuck through their, past the barb, through their clothes. And you have to cut them off. You know? When the line's going into the motor back there, stuff like that. You know, you, you get to choose what you're going to think about. Am I going to think about the fact that I could have caught more fish if they weren't here? Am I going to think about, you know, how frustrating it is to put my pole down again to work on this? Or am I going to think about making memories with little kids who'd rather have a picnic than they would catch a fish? I said, Rachel, pack them like three or four lunches because when they get on the water, they eat like madmen. <laughs> it's 8 a.m. It's 8 a.m. we just gotten out there. They're breaking out peanut butter and jelly, <laughs> chips, trying to pass them up. And I'm like, I don't even get to eat today. I mean, every time they do this. These kids will not eat at home. You can fix a gourmet meal, lay it out, they won't eat. You get them out on the water, they eat everything in sight. I said, just pack them a good picnic, we'll have a good trip. All right, what am I going to think about? Am I going to think about the fact that I'm healthy? I live in a free country. My children are healthy. My little five-year-old just caught a fish before Daddy did. I could go either way with that one, but, you know, <laughs> the joy on his face when he did that. Another time I said, y'all bring your stuff in because we're going to move down the way, you know, and, oh, we're playing, Dad, you know, and all that. And he starts reeling in. I look up, he's got a fish. It's, it's, just, it's probably, been, <laughs> we've probably been dragging him around for a quarter of a mile, you know. <laughs> I'm up here working, not catching nothing. He's got one. He's dragging back behind the motor. <laughs> if I catch that when he gets off, the five-year-old catches it, God smiles on him, you know, and he. But I get to choose what I'm going to think about. I get to choose how I'm going to. Enjoy these moments, right? I get to choose. I get to choose. I get to think about certain things. Verse 7 says, And we, it will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. Focus your minds, in other words. Make a decision. I'm going to fix my thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. I'm going to choose to think about good things. Remember, defense, I'm going to push out the negative thoughts. Offense, I'm going to choose to think about things that build me up. And then I want to mention something in verse 9. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me. Some things in the spiritual realm you've got to learn experientially. You've got to take the knowledge that you've been given and then you've got to live it out. Let's suppose I wanted to be a great fisherman. I got with a guy who had all the knowledge, and he had the maps, and he had uh, Google Earth, and we could sit down and strategize, and he could tell me where the fish are this time of year and where he's caught them before and all that, and we could sit there around the table and eat and talk and discuss, and, and what do you think about this, and would they want this color today? Well, it's a little bit sunny. It's a little bit cloudy. Do you think they're at six foot? Do you think they're at two foot? Are they top to bottom? What, whatever. We could sit there and talk about it all day, but probably what he's going to say is let's get in the boat and go out there and let's, let's figure it out. So you take the knowledge, the, the intellectual knowledge, and you put it into practice, and then it becomes experiential knowledge. And you learn it even better. And Paul said, continue these things day after day after day. Keep putting into practice all that you've learned. 
Now, let me ask you this. How are you going to fix your mind this week on good things? How are you going to take control? How are you going to surrender and let God take control of your mind this week? First of all, number one, don't go to steps two, three, and four. First, we need to examine ourselves and say, do I have the Spirit of God? Because if you don't have the Spirit of God, steps two, three, and four aren't going to help you very much. If you don't have the Spirit of God living in you, you're not going to have the mind of God. And the Spirit of God comes to anyone who accepts Jesus Christ by faith, who recognizes they are a sinner, accepts the sacrifice that he made, Ask for forgiveness. Ask him to fill their life, their mind, their heart, their soul, their spirit. Ask him to make their reservation secure in heaven. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. When a person does that, they receive the Spirit of God. Now, when Jesus taught on eternity, he said, there's coming a day of judgment, and there'll be people standing in front of me, and they'll say, Lord, Lord, but I did this. I cast out demons, and I, and I did many wonderful things in your name. And he said, I'm going to look at them and say, depart from me. I never knew you. We were never in a relationship. Now, if they did a lot of things in his name, that means they were very close to the things of God. Otherwise, there'd be no reason to be doing the things of God. They were, they were in a place like this, in a group like this, and they were doing things that looked just like the people who were genuine believers. And he said, but I never knew you. Now, here's the part that bothers me about this passage. Jesus said, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. That means many people are confused. That means many people think they contain the Spirit of God, that they have given their, that they have surrendered their life to Him, and they have not. Many will say to me. You say, well, I don't know if I'm convinced. Well, there's another place where he says, narrow is the road to life, and few people find it. Broad is the road to destruction, and many find it. We got to be among the few, and not among the many and so we got to have the holy spirit of god if we ever want to win this battle right here secondly even if we do have the holy spirit we have to constantly surrender our mind to the spirit of god you got to say god i give you control of my mind today i recommend doing it before you ever get out of the bed god i surrender my mind to you today in ephesians 5 and verse 18 paul says don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life that's not the primary teaching here but that is a true statement independently he said don't get drunk where you give control of yourself over to another which is drunkenness alcohol you give your life over it takes control of everything when you give yourself completely over to drunkenness he said don't do that but instead be filled with the holy spirit surrender your whole self to the Spirit of God. When you do that, you'll find yourself, verse 19, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making music to the Lord in your hearts and giving thanks for everything to God the Father in our Lord Jesus Christ. So make sure you have the Spirit, surrender the Spirit. Thirdly, listen to God. This is not, this is elementary, but it has to be said. Listen to God. You say, well, how do I listen to God? Pray and listen. Read His Word. He's already revealed a lot of His mind right here. Read His Word. You might want to listen to some preaching. I listen to preaching during the week. When I'm working out, I turn on a, a sermon and listen to it, and it, it helps me. You might want to do that. Do you know the, you, you guys today in this era that we live in, you have more access to the things of God than any generation by a thousand times. You can listen to the best preachers all over this country, literally all over this world, on your phone, your tablet, your computer, anytime you want to. Church is in session. You could listen to that. That might help you. That, that's good for some. It helps some. You say, well, preacher, I just don't have time. I just don't have any more time. Well, listen, make some. Make some so you can win this battle right here. Some of you need to start listening to Christian music. You're not doing that right now. I can't understate, I can't overstate the importance of this. When you get in your car and you turn that ignition I don't know where you're going, and I don't know what that environment's going to be like when you get there, but I promise you, you need something good on the way. You're going to need it. Where you're going, you're going to need it. So you need, when you turn the ignition, whatever type of Christian music you like, and that's the other good thing, you get to pick, okay? What comes over those speakers in your car, you get to pick. So get you a CD, get you an MP3 player, get you a cassette tape, get you an 8-track, Get you something. <laughs> AM, FM, something. Plug your phone into it. Whatever you got to do. Pandora. Whatever you got to do. 
It's free. There's lots of it. And when you're going down the road, you need to be listening to it. God will speak to you through song. There's some incredible music out there. Some people, as I mentioned earlier, like to put scriptures on cards and put them places that will remind you. I recommend that. For years and years, people have done one-page devotions like Daily Bread or Open Windows or they're on your app. There's on your uh, Bible apps. There's devotions that take five minutes. Read it. Maybe it's one or two verses and an explanation and say, God, as I have time today, I want to go back and meditate on this thought. I want to go back, not on ten thoughts, not on a chapter, not on a whole book of the Bible, but I want to go back and just think about these couple of verses and these couple of thoughts that are right here. I want to meditate on those so they sink in in my mind and my heart. I'll tell you another underutilized resource, and that is for those of you that are note takers in places like this or in a Sunday school class or in a small group, go back and look at those notes. I grew up in a, uh, going to church every Sunday, and we would go to Sunday lunch, and we would talk about how beautiful the ser- service was and how awesome the sermon was and, and all that. But I know this, if I didn't go back and look at those notes by Monday or Tuesday, it was all, phew. It didn't matter how well it was presented. It didn't matter how articulate the person was. It didn't matter if the Holy Spirit had worked through them, and I had heard some things that had helped me. If I didn't go back and look at those notes and run those things back to my mind, teachers, repetition, help me out we got to have repetition, right, to learn something. And so i got to go back and run those things back through my mind in order to get them. Listen to God, and this one will be obvious. Talk to God. But I don't just mean like a few minutes in the morning, but I mean talk to Him all day. God, thank You for my health. Thank You for this day. God, this isn't my favorite job in the whole world, but thank You that I have it. Thank You that I can make an income. Thank You that I have a roof over my head, that I have air and heat and a bed to lay on. Thank you for these things. You know, the, 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 the mealtime prayer has kind of been minimized as, as you know, insignificant. But, but let me just for a moment, let me just challenge you to rethink that. If three times a day you stopped and said, God, I thank you for these provisions, like you are the giver of all that is good, uh, every good and perfect gift come, comes from the Heavenly Father. And today, God, I'm not going to have to worry about starving to death like some people on planet Earth are. My spouse isn't, my children, my grandchildren, my neighbor. We're not any of us probably going to starve to death today, God, because you have made provisions for us. We don't understand why we're so blessed and other people are struggling just to survive, but for these three meals, these three different times during the day, I just want to say thank you for your provisions. If you're in a public place, do it there for sure. You ought to see us. If you ever see us at a restaurant, you should pull up a table, chair close if you see us about to pray because it is quite entertaining. Um, Levi, the the, uh, five-year-old, he's the designated prayer. And so everybody bow y'all's heads. He won't start unless everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And he starts thanking God for everything. You know, thank you that we could go to Texas Roadhouse. Thank you for these peanuts. He'll crack his eyes open and see what's on the table. Thank you for these uh, plates and the drinks. And thank you for these peanuts and the bread, Lord. And thank you for all these things. And thank you that we could have a good day and, and give us travel and safety. And thank you that we could have a good day and give us travel and safety. And, 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 and some of it's so low we can't hear it. So, we, you know, everybody's waiting for the person closest to him to know that he said amen so we know it's time to eat, you know. So... But we just, it's a long deal. It's like he didn't have his quiet time. So we're, we're just waiting and waiting and waiting. And, and, but, but, but I'm thankful that he does somehow recognize these things come from God and we're thanking him for them. And we should do that. Even if we just did that three times a day and said, God, thank you for these provisions. I'm telling you, we get to choose what we think about and we are very, very blessed. Talk to God all day long. I'm telling you, these little sentences prayers or conversations with God could totally revolutionize your spiritual experience. If you could just pause for a moment and talk to God. Thank Him for something. Pray about something that's come up. You know, you say, hey, Lord, Lord, I remember it said don't worry, so I don't want to worry. Instead, I'm going to pray, tell you what I need, and thank you for what you've done. I wonder what would happen if we all turned off some of the noise and garbage this week and, and got serious about focusing our minds and our hearts on good things. Paul said, fix your mind on these things. 
I wonder what would happen if we'd play a little better defense this week and a little better offense this week, and we'd cut out some things that don't need to be there and not entertain things that don't need to be there, and, and we would take in some things that would be helpful. I wonder what would happen if God had full control of just, just us in this room, of our minds. We truly let him direct our paths this week. I, I wonder what would happen. I wonder if a relationship might be restored, if we really fully surrendered our mind, our heart, our will to God this week. I, I wonder, some of you that raised your hand earlier and said, I'm having trouble going to sleep. I wonder how much better you would sleep if you would not worry and you would pray and you'd tell God what you need and thank him for what he's already done. I wonder if it'd be different when you lay your head on your pillow and you could go on to sleep like your spouse does, some of you. I wonder how much more light we could bring into the lives of our friends and family if we would get our minds right, if, if we'd allow God to win the battle in our mind this week.